We are in James chapter 3, verse 13, if you want to turn there. James chapter 3, verse 13. It says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly and sensual and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And one of the things that God's just been speaking to me uh, about the last couple weeks in, in a number of different ways is having discernment. Scripturally, uh, what we're called to have as Christians is a spiritual discernment, an understanding of the things that are going on around us from a um, view that is larger than just this world. In other words, we're supposed to have in our minds on a daily basis that everything that's going on needs to be brought to a place where we're looking at eternity when we're making decisions. You want biblical discernment, spiritual discernment. One of the things that has to happen is you have to recognize this life is not your home. Eternity's coming. And your decisions today should be based upon how is it going to affect eternity, my eternity and others' eternity. And when you begin to get that concept in place, then how you live your life begins to change drastically. Your peace, your joy, your hope, it comes pouring in because then it's not about what's happening to you at this moment. It's about what's going to happen to you when Jesus comes and he's coming later tonight, maybe early in the morning. Just kidding. Well, I hope I'm not. I hope I, I, I'm not prophesying that because I, you're not, no man knows the day or the hour, and so I, I don't, I don't want to get in the way of Jesus coming. But we're told to expect him today. And in that expectation, there is certainly an awareness that should happen, ha be happening in our hearts that says, wait a minute, Everything that's going on right now doesn't carry the same weight of, you know, in our world right now, there's a lot of things that are going on that aren't right, that are a mess, that it, truly it's disappointing. It, it's almost hopeless in many ways. You look what, what's going on and you just think, wow, is it dark out there? When you have in mind as a Christian eternity, you go, oh, all of a sudden you have hope because you go, oh, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. There is a hope for what's happening in our world for us as Christians that go beyond the current conditions we're in. And that's really what I wanted to, actually, if I was going to title this message, it would be disappoint, uh, uh, discernment, don't leave home without it. And actually, you better have it at home because if you don't, your wife or husband will let you know. Philippians 1.9 says this, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may, may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And there is an encouragement for us to begin this process of allowing God to give us really his mind, to think his thoughts after him, to look at what's happening in our lives, the good stuff and the bad, because it, it's true. Good stuff and bad stuff happens to all of us. There's a verse uh, from Philippians 4.13. It says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't you love that verse? Now, the context of that verse is Paul saying, you know, with much or little, with good stuff or bad stuff happening, I've learned that God's the same in the midst of those events. And if you're going to have spiritual discernment, if you're going to have wisdom, then you have to view the events that are happening in your life 
from a different perspective. So if you go to the book of Job, and I encourage everyone, if you've never read the book of Job, you need to read it. It's one of the most impactful books you'll ever read. It really begins to help you see what God wants to do in the life of a Christian. Because Job is a guy that God's bragging on. Have you noticed my servant Job? A righteous man. He always does what's right. And, and after the Lord says that, the next thing you see about Job is he loses everything that he has. He, his kids get killed. He loses his health. He's sitting naked, sc scraping his oozing uh, sores on his body in the ashes of his house with his wife walking up to him saying, Job, curse God and die. Man, that's hopeful. Yeah, I mean, you, it sounds like a guy that's got it all together. And yet, Job's response was, though he slay me, yet will I follow him. And that's a great response. That's an absolute right response for someone that has an awesome spiritual discernment. That God's bigger than this moment. That eternity matters more than what's happen, happening to me right now. Now, here's the deal, though. And here's why Job is so good. For the next 20 plus chapters, Job whines like a mule. Oh God, why was I ever born? It would have been better if I would have just never even been born. My life is a wreck. And after, and Job has some friends that are knuckleheads. That's the nicest thing I can say about them. <laughs> Actually, at the end of this whole process that God's doing in Job's life, um, God tells Job, now, Job, you need to go pray for your friends or I'm going to kill them because they gave really, really bad advice. But all of that time is God doing this work in Job of look, making him understand eternity. And so after Job whines for a while, the Lord says to Job, Job, come here. I need you to listen up, Bucky. That's in the original Hebrew. And, and he goes, you tell me how this happened. How, how, did, how were the skies created? How were the stars created? How, how, how does the winds work? How, and he just keeps asking question after question after question that is obviously beyond Job's understanding. And at the end of that, Job says, oh, Lord, I, I hear you. And God says, no, you don't. <laughs> no, I, you don't get this yet. You need to understand, I'm God. I've got this plan. And so he questions him for a while, and then Job says, God, I heard of you with my ear, but now, now I see you. I get it. God goes, awesome. And Job, by the way, I'm going to restore everything. But he loses it all again, by the way. He ends up dying. Because this life is not what it's all about. And that's what Job finally gets. And for us as Christians, if you're going to be a discerning Christian, a wise Christian, someone that's living with wisdom that affects lives, that has the power of God behind them, then you have to know this. Everything, the good and the bad, that goes on in this life is part of God's plan for eternity. So there was good stuff that happened for Jesus, but mostly bad. There's good stuff that happened for Paul, but a lot of bad. And you can go down through every person on the face of the planet, and that's the truth. Because it's a fallen world, and when sin entered in, so did death. So um, what everyone in this room should be aware of, everyone on the face of the planet should be aware of this. They are sinners. I, when I meet someone that thinks they're a good person, I love to start questioning them. <laughs> you ever lie? Well, only little white lies. Oh, okay, tell, let's go ask your parents about that. And they never want me to. Or, you know, you just go down through and you begin to talk to them and it becomes very apparent that they are self-centered and focused on themselves. And I, I became a Christian because my wife became, got saved, started living for Jesus, and her lifestyle convicted me. I'm like, she is way nicer than me. And I tried out nicer, and I could not. 
And I, then I'm looking at myself in the mirror going, wow, that guy is a jerk because I knew every thought I thought. I knew how selfish and self-centered and how much I didn't care about others and cared about myself and how I'd hurt others. Even though, you know, I was a fireman at the time for the U.S. Forest Service and I would go out and put out fires and save Bambi, literally, from Disney. No. <laughs> but we would go out and fight fires and people loved uh, the, uh, just talking to me as a fireman and that whole process and that, that was something that I, I was doing for a living. Uh, you know, there was a respect that I received for that. But what I knew is ultimately there was this core of self-centeredness in me that I could not deal with. Even though I had gone out and actually saved lives, I knew the core of self-centeredness. And that's what God's dealing with, right? He's dealing with people that have issues with their sin. And all of us do. And what God does is he comes in and he, he begins to change us and give us a different mind. We're supposed to be a new creation. Old things pass away and new things come. So as Christians, Jesus goes, there's two, two rules. You keep these two commandments, you're good to go. Love God with everything you've got and love others. Now to live that in a discerning manner that truly has wisdom attached to it, you have to begin to look at your life. Think about what's going on and ask God to show you how to really live in a manner that reflects your storing up your treasure in heaven. See, if you're not a Christian, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously it's a Wednesday night, and I don't know you, you all. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm assuming that most of you are Christians, or, most, or all of you actually, from this study. But if you're not a Christian, this is what's going to happen through the study. You're going to go, I don't have that kind of wisdom. And I see that I am incredibly self-centered. That's what I think about. And that, at some point, if there's a God, and I, and I have a reasonable, intelligent faith that I can prove, you, prove to you there's a creator, and I can intelligently and, in, and reasonably prove to you this book is trustworthy, and what it says is at some point, you're going to die, and then you're going to stand before the Lord. And you answer for your life. And what you've done with it. Whether or not you came to him, or whether or not you lived for yourself. When I was 28, living for myself, I couldn't hack it anymore. I couldn't stand the thought of dying and going before the creator of the universe without forgiveness, standing in my own righteousness. And so at that point, I did the wisest thing I've ever done, incredibly wise. Again, hey, I'm, I made this deal with the Lord. It's right out of scripture. Actually, I went and talked to a pastor and I said, what do you have to do to get saved? And he goes, well, here's the deal. The Bible says, if you will give God your life and mean it, he'll Take your sin and throw it as far as the east is from the west, and he won't remember it anymore, and you will become a new creation. And he goes, you know, and there's, your life is going to change. Well, I had drinking and cussing and sex and all kinds of stuff going on in my life at that point, and I'm sitting there looking at myself, and I realize, wait, something needs to happen here because I don't like this person I am. And I'm being told I can be totally forgiven and made new. And all I have to do is go, I'm going to give you my life. That's the deal. Having a relationship with the Lord is very specifically done on his terms, not ours. Jesus goes, all you have to do is believe in me. That word believe in the original Greek means to rely on, cling to, adhere to. In other words, he gets to be the boss. He gets to go, hey, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to have you do some things different than you were. So I, I knew sitting in my pickup truck that I was not going to be able to cuss freely like I had before that. Before I became a Christian, I would cuss about 30 cuss words a minute, gusts up to about 60. Right? And that's about right. 
And, and you know, I drank and got drunk and I did stuff that I knew. I went, my dad was an alcoholic grown up. I know the cost of, of alcohol and um, getting drunk. And I went, you know, if I turn to the Lord, I know he wants my life to be radically different. And I'm, I need to be willing for him to say, don't do that. So I'm sitting there in the truck and I go, okay, this is wisdom. For every person on the face of the planet, the wisest thing that you'll ever do is go, okay, I'm coming to you on your terms. Please forgive me. I give you my whole life now. Write my name in your book of life and make me a believer. And that's basically what I, you know, I, I did it, you know, I'm, at that point, I'm, I'm just a hick fireman and I go, um, I don't really know how to do this, but if you'll forgive me, I'm going to let you be the boss. <laughs> that's, that's the extent of the depth of my prayer. Instantly for me, the weight of the world came off of me. Clean. I'm looking around my truck. Okay, that was the best washing I've ever had. I don't know. I do not know what happened, but that's stinking cool. I could not wait to get to work and tell my brother all about it. Now, my brother was not a believer, and he looked at me and went, don't be weird. Oh. And, and so I didn't tell anybody for a while after that. But you know what I wasn't willing to do? Not follow Jesus. Because there was no way I, did, I wanted to leave that place that he had given me. Being clean for the first time, totally forgiven. Your sins thrown as far as the east is from, made righteous. And we'll look at that here in a second. That's what drives us to have spiritual discernment and wisdom. It starts with that relationship with the Lord. That's what's supposed to be going on in our, our lives. James, in this book, he's just talked in the first part of chapter 3, and he's talked about the tame and that, the tongue and how you can't tame it. It's a restless evil, and it's just messed up. So I, I, you, I, I can prove that to you. Go on Facebook and see what people say. <laughs> and the things they say on Facebook are, I, I, uh, my eye twitches. And it's amazing, absolutely amazing, how much we are bent toward not caring about how we're affecting the people around us. How we just want to say what we want to say because it's our right. You know what the right you have? Seriously, you know what the right of a Christian is? Here it is. Get ready. Write it down. Probably heard this 40 times before, but this, it's all new today. The right of, the of every Christian on the face of the planet is the same right that Jesus had. The right to give up our rights. That's an awesome right. You know, I didn't have that ability before I became a Christian. I, it was all about me. What can I get out of this? It's all, I just want more for me. And Jesus said, I just gave you absolute eternity with me where it takes all of that eternity for me to show you how much I love you. That in my presence is, and this is a verse that every one of us should know absolutely locked tightly in our heads. It takes all of eternity for God to show us how much he loves us. And then um, that verse that I was going to make sure you knew and was in your head, I just forgot. What's that? That's not it. It'll come back because it's locked so tightly. In his presence, got it, there it was. In his presence is fullness of joy. And, oh, well, you didn't finish it to help me remember. <laughs> that, again, that's my wife and she's here to complete me when I let her. That is, man, uh, I, I am telling you, that should drive us as Christians. And so as we begin to live, and we want wisdom and understanding, and it says this, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
Are you allowing God to really show the truth of his wisdom, the meekness of wisdom? Meekness in scripture means this, power under control. It's not uh, Marvin Milktoast. I don't know if you know who that is. It's the wimpy little guy that wouldn't say anything no matter what. It's I know the truth and I will share it with you at an appropriate time. I don't have to slam you. I don't have to prove myself right. It's literally someone that has the ability to do the right thing, but doesn't just come in and slam people. So when I was a brand new pastor, I, um, at, with, I'd started a, a Thursday night Bible study and it had grown and uh, now we're doing Sunday morning and we'd actually had to rent a, a church for um, Wednesday nights because there's too many people coming to fit in my house so we're in this church and this lady shows up and she starts talking about once saved always saved and, and predestination and free will and she was from you know it, once saved always saved background and I, as this incredibly mature and learned, learned pastor, heard her say this, and she starts talking with somebody else, and then I decided I'd come in and really just show her all that I knew. And as I'm talking, I, and I can just see it happening, and I still, every time I, I remember this, I just want to slap myself in the back of the head about 50 times, because I just overwhelmed her and I wasn't reaching her I was just proving my point she wasn't understanding she just had no answers to it and all she knew is this guy came in and slammed her and what she thought was the truth and what she had been taught and it, there was no wisdom in it there was just an ability to tell the truth without any love and what God wants in our lives is something different than that, that meekness, that ability to look at the person and go, what's best for them? God, show me how to reach out and touch people. So, so often people go, I really don't know what to say to people. Ask the Lord. How do you witness to somebody? Care enough about them to tell them the truth in love. Look at them and see the value that God's placed in them. Those are the things that are supposed to be going on. Here's the deal, though. Actually, this is from um, Second, uh, sorry, First John. John um, is just encouraging, uh, as he's writing that book, John is encouraging believers to really have love. But you have to have a mature love. And so he writes about three different maturity levels. And he says there's babes or children. And then he says there's young men. And then they, he says fathers. And, and when you're a, a babe in Christ, actually Hebrews 5.13 says this, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature um, mature who by constant use have trained themselves to dis distinguish good from evil. And so when we get saved, the first thing that we know is, I'm forgiven, and you need to get saved too. And so it, we come in and we start sharing that with people. And I, I shared that with a number of people that I was so forceful with this new truth that I had that they didn't talk to me, some of them, for five or six years. And you know what they called me? One of those self-righteous Christians. Because I, I, I had truth, but I didn't have love. I didn't have maturity. I had this deal where I'm a kid. I know that I'm forgiven. I love the salvation that God's given me. But I didn't have the ability to look at people and love them. And care about them. And really look at what's happening. So that I could be discerning about how I brought the truth of God's love to them. What you see in 1 John is um, the um, second level of maturity is called um, young men. And basically the difference between them and, and the younger group is that they know the word. They've, they've moved away from the things that used to ensnare them. 
And then they go, I, I know the word and I'm applying it to my life. So what I'm saying here as we go through there is the meekness of wisdom that has to be found in knowing God's word. You're not going to be mature. You're not going to be able to lead anyone. And, and whether you're a man or a woman here, you have a responsibility as a Christian to be the example, to lead, to show people love. And you can't do that if you don't know the word, because you're not going to give them the depth. God's word is very clearly something that, that changes lives. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, you know, I actually I was sharing um, with Matt and Kyle today and just talking about how thankful we all should be. And so, whatever you guys do, do not give this tape to Steve. God has given us this guy that has an awesome gift, and it's, it's all Jesus in him, but he's got this awesome gift of helping us understand the word. To the depth of it from cover to cover. He teaches through that. Uh, I've been raised in uh, um, every church that I've ever been in. Just love to help people hunger and thirst for his word. To know it. To not settle for the milk, but rather the meat. And I, I just, man, uh, again, let's burn this tape because if... <laughs> I don't ever want to say anything nice about Steve, at least to, uh, only uh, to his faith, because that's our love language is sarcasm, just so you know. Uh, if Steve's too nice to me, I'm like, uh-oh, something's wrong. Yeah, you, have you ever noticed he picks on me a lot here? That's because that's how we love each other. That's how we, we know. And, and I, I like that, and we, don't, we try not to take ourselves too serious and all that stuff. There's a process in that. But honestly... Um, you know, I, I can't even tell you how thankful I am for having had men around me that made me hunger and thirst for his word. That, that literally went, I need to know this, that I saw him apply it. You know, when I um, first moved here in 1990, I became an elder. And I'm a young guy, and God's doing a uh, work you know, through our lives as we moved up from California and, st and people are starting to come to the church and so it gets bigger and we have to do all the stuff that you do to set up a new church and then we make a board and it's me and Steve and uh, Marty. And so I'm, I'm on the board and, and I'm, when Steve's gone I end up teaching and so I'm known and there's stuff going on in the midst of that and so some lady comes up to me and she says, hey, I, I have this question. And it was about finances. And I, I just read a chapter in the Old Testament. And I gave her that chapter and went, well, this is what the Old Testament kind of says about this. And I see her light up and I see her run off. And the Holy Spirit's going, you didn't ask me, did you? And I know I'm in trouble, seriously. I'm, I, I went running. I'm, I didn't know what I'd done. I just knew I hadn't done the right thing. So I go to Steve and I go, um, I gave this lady this advice. And he goes, um, here's the verses that you should have looked at. And he did it so nicely. You stupid idiot, he said. No, he didn't say that. But he's looking at me like, I can't, can't, what? Here's the verses. Okay. And then he looks at me and goes, go fix it. All right. So I went to fix it and, and went, hey, I am really sorry. That was bad advice. And unfortunately for me, she was already bought in and she didn't care what I had to say. I, I'm like, please listen, please. And, and off she went and did my first advice to her. And how did that go? Not well. It was because I hadn't thought it through. I didn't have the depth of God's word. I, I gave an answer before I really checked to see what God had to say. Don't give answers before you check with the Lord in his word. 
You know, sometimes people go, well, I really feel like the Spirit's telling me. I just had someone do this. I really feel like God's telling me this person's right for me. Are they a believer? Well, they're going to be. Let me hit you. That is not what the Word says. You don't get yoked to an unbeliever. See the process here? There has to be this wisdom, and it's in meekness. In other words, wait a minute, even though I know the truth, I need to stop and wait and let God speak to my heart. And then it, it goes on here in verse 14, and it does um, a, just a reminder of things that can't be in our life if we're going to give people wisdom. James says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. You are never going to be that person that has spiritual discernment, meekness of wisdom, if you have bitterness. Okay, okay. Well, let me say this. Okay, here's how you get rid of bitterness. If you've, I've been bitter in the past, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've been bitter, then you, you go, how do I get past it? Here's the way. Um, this was... Uh, one of the most helpful things anybody's ever done for me. Um, me and my wife are known for our quiet and gentle relationship. Did you hear her laugh? We're known for being rowdy. That's what we're known for. And we, we have fought like cats and dogs. It's absolutely a miracle that God has kept us together. So over the years, he's taught us more and more how to uh, have a meek attitude, how to love like God loves, how to get over ourselves. But um, just a few years after we'd moved up here, three or four, and we'd gotten a big fight, and we had some friends that said, hey, we'd love to help you. And so we go over to their house, and I really like this couple. They were awesome. And we sit down, and, and I'm, you know, I want to make sure that everybody understands that, well, we need a little help, but, you know, it's not that bad. And my wife just goes, Pfft! And, and she just throws me under the bus as far as I'm concerned. Just, he's a big jibbing. And that's what, I, that's what I'm hearing. That's not what she's doing, but that's what I'm hearing. And I like these people, and she's exposing all of my stuff to them, and I am getting mad. <sighs> bitter. <laughs> Husbands, don't be bitter against your wives. I'm absolutely flaming mad. And the lady, this lady who I think uh, seriously is the most, godly Christian I knew at that point. She just looks at me with her little smile and goes, what's wrong? Did you not hear what she just said about me? And she goes, yes, I did. Can I just tell you a story? Yes, it'll keep her from telling more stories. Absolutely tell me a story. And so she goes on and she tells me something that her husband had said to her in, in the not-too-distant past. And it was horrific. I, I really, I literally turned to the guy and went, you did not. He goes, yeah. And I'm like, I should stand up and hit you. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm thinking in my head. And then she turns to me and she goes, you know what God told me about that? So it's much worse than anything my wife had said about me in our little meeting. Much worse. And she's, she gives me that little smile and says, you know what God told me about that? I'm like, uh, to kill him, burn him with gas, what? And she goes, why are you, he, God told me, why are you so upset? You're worse than that. Oh, no, you're, you're perfect little Christian woman. And then I had to apply that. Wait a minute. I deserve to fry in hell for eternity. I don't have to be bitter about things that happen to me. The truth is I deserve worse. That's not what God has for me. But the truth is Jesus didn't deserve to go to the cross, did he? But for others he did. And I began to go through a process of taking my thoughts captive to the truth. And not being bitter and angry and mad at people. Can't be bitter and have wisdom. You can't have envy. Listen, you know what envy is? 
Envy is absolutely the opposite of everything that has to do with Jesus. Jesus didn't hold on to his right to everything that he was as God, but gave it up so that he could come and pay for me. He deserved absolutely everything that's good. And he took on everything that's bad. And so if I see somebody with something that I don't have, I need to go, man, God, thanks for giving it to them. I'm glad for what I have. There should be an attitude of thankfulness for every Christian, no matter what the circumstance. And I understand that sometimes the circumstances are bad, like Job was. And that's why I mentioned Job to begin this study. So Job whines for 20 plus chapters. And sometimes we need to just go through the process of going, God, what is up? But ultimately it's this, it's a fallen world. The world's fallen, bad stuff happens in this life. And if you're just trying to fix this life, then listen, you have no joy, you have no peace, you don't have hope. Because again, Job had everything restored and then died anyway because the world's fallen. When sin entered into the world, so did death. So there should be something that tells us bitterness and envy and self-seeking is something that will destroy every good work that God wants to do in my life. It will make me the guy that has no depth, that is nothing but living on milk. It's all about me and my salvation. And, I, and it is. You can be a Christian and it can be all about, God save me, that's awesome. But that's not what, where he wants to leave you. He has, a, a, um, Ephesians 2.10, a work planned for you that he's prepared beforehand for you. And it is to go out and touch lives, not to be successful, not to be married and have a happy family. You may get all that, but that's not what, that is not what you're here for. You're here to be a light and salt and example to people about the love of Jesus. And guys, you need to be excited. The world is dark now. It sees itself as enlightened, and it is so incredibly dark that it's easy to be a light. The greater the darkness, the less light you need to make it look really bright. And you just begin to stand. And it, you can't look like them. It can't be about you. You've already gotten everything. When he paid for your sin... He gave you his righteousness. Remember that, because that's going to be on the test later. Uh, can you guys hand out? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it's important to be in that place where you have the fruit of his righteousness, and that fruit is, I'm set free from this life. I'm now a citizen of heaven. And I'm going to act like it, and I'm going to live like it, and I'm going to give advice like that. I'm going to point people to Jesus, not to this world. You can't do it if you have that self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast against and lie against the truth. And there's whole groups of Christians that are telling you you need to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you just need to go pat them on the head and say, you'll grow. <laughs> Because the, sooner or later, they're going to face death. Sooner or later, they're going to face trials. Jesus says, just like me, you're going to go through trials. Every Christian is going to go through trials. It's a fallen world. It's okay. He's got it. He's already, he knows the plan. You can know that he's, he's waiting for you. You know, the moment every Christian is supposed to be waiting for is that moment when you are standing before him, and he goes, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, in my case, I go, I know it smells like smoke, but I'm forgiven, right? 
And that's all I care about. I stand before the guy that loves me, that's never left me. And I, and I just go, thank you, thank you for forgiving me despite me. Thank you that I, you called me and I answered. That's who I rely and trust and cling to. The other wisdom, it says in verse 15, it descends from, it does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So every time you hear people getting you focused on yourself, you know what that is? Demonic. You know, when I, I talk to people all the time and going through hard, different circumstances, there are hard, hard circumstances in our life. And, and I do not point them to themselves. I point them to Jesus and I point them to others. Because when they get outwardly focused, the joy comes. They see their use. They see the hope of eternity. When I just encourage them to stay in this place where they're self-focused and, you know, there's um, lots of worldly wisdom that says you need to love yourself, you need to take care of yourself. Yeah, actually, my wife left me because I said these words to her. I learned it from, from the U.S. government, sent me to a class over a weekend, and here's what the class taught me. Very specifically, I cannot take care of others until I take care of myself. So I came back and I went, I love that. So I, I come back and my wife's like, hey, can you help me with this? And I go, no, I need to go fishing because I need to take care of myself before I take care of you. And then when I got home, I had to take care of myself because she was gone. <laughs> and not that quickly, but it felt that quick. Yeah, I mean, that went so bad for me so quickly. And that's the lie that the world's telling people over and over and over in every kind of way. It's sensual and it's demonic. You don't get people focused more on themselves. When someone's going through a tragedy, you focus them on Jesus, on eternity, not on this life. You know, the world gives terrible advice. The world gives advice that keeps people in bondage, overwhelmed, and on, on some medication too many times. Don't listen to the world. Jesus loves you, and Jesus will set you free as you just focus on him and the truth of eternity and all that's coming for you. Even as you go through a messed up world, and it's still good because, listen, you can affect people for Jesus. There, there's nothing better on the face of the planet than affecting people for Jesus. I, I, I've had the absolute privilege of leading people to the Lord. And there's those moments where you, you pray with them and they have been overwhelmed and they're just broken. And you go, you want to accept Jesus? And they say yes. And they say that prayer with you. And, and, and I was like, I'll pray with you. you. You want to pray? No, you pray. Okay, I'll pray for you. And I pray and I just go, and, and um, you're now clean. And I look up and there are tears streaming out of their eyes. And they got this smile. And they go, I'm forgiven. And I, I'm like, okay, Jesus, come back right now. That was the last one, right? Still not the one. Because I want to go to be with Jesus in that moment where I've shared the love of Jesus with someone. There's nothing better you'll ever do. Wisdom, discernment, spiritual discernment is focusing on the next life, not this one. Verse 17, uh, actually verse 16, for where in envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. And I covered that. But the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that comes from God is first pure. That's interesting. Is first pure. Pure. 
James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your, your hearts, you double-minded. Can't be double-minded. The wisdom that's from above is first pure. This is what I know. People have hope in one person only. You can't ever, as a Christian, and I've heard guys of major denominations say, it's okay to uh, um, accept other religions. We're all the same. God is the same for the Muslims. He's the same for the Mormons. He's the same for the Christians. And, and I just want to say, not so. And I want to whack them. And, I, and Jesus very specifically talks about those guys as people that destroy lives. That is not true. It's not pure. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through me. He says, if you're going to have a relationship with me, then you're going to come to that relationship according to my terms. Do you know that there are unconditional promises? But they're, they're all based upon this, accepting the terms of his salvation. I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I'm seeing what I want to do and what I don't want to do. John 5, 24 says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come unto judgment, but is passed from death to life. Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 14, 25. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes with me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? There's a cost for being a Christian. We get into agreement with Jesus. He's got this plan for you. And it's according to his word. You can't have this pure life without being in agreement with the Lord. So I got saved. And I knew instantly, right? And so I went and tell, tell my brother. I told my brother. He mocks me, so I don't tell anybody. And, but I'm, I'm like, I... I don't know what this is, but I'm, I am not giving this up. This is good. And so I'm sneaking reading my wife's Bible. She'd go off to Bible study. Oh, man, she got an extra one. You know, she's off and she, she's in the restroom. Is there something? I'm sneaking reading the Bible because I don't want her to know. And I, I'm praying. I, I, from the day I got saved, I've never been drunk again. Because when I'm sitting in my truck, that was a deal that God made. He goes, no more drinking. No more getting drunk. Okay. And, and, you know, I, it was about three months before I actually told my wife that I was a Christian. I actually went to church and stood up and, and did the official thing. But uh, those three months, uh, she came home from Bible study once, and, and she goes into our closet and comes out and looks at me. She had that weird look. Where's your Playboy's? Um, I threw them away. Why? Felt like it. And it's true. God goes, hey, throw those away. All right, I'll just throw these away. It began to change me. My cussing went from 30 to 60 cuss words a minute down to two to four. And it was just going down. God began to cleanse me because I'm in agreement with him. I'm still just, matter of fact, I just was about to lie. I know that I'm a bigger sinner today than I ever knew I was then. It's not that I'm not a sinner now. I'm worse than I, I, my awareness of how bent I am toward being um, selfish is way more complete today than it was then. 
just because I don't, I don't know the last time I cussed, I don't know the last time I drank, I don't know lots of things, I don't know the last time I lied, whatever, does that make me righteous at all? Not a bit. Not nothing. No. I, I, I'm sitting talking to, uh, actually this last week, and I, I got to talk to some people that don't know Jesus, and th- you know what I left them with? That guy thinks he's a bigger jerk than I am. And I, and I say jerk, but I, I'm, that guy thinks that he is a bigger mess than I think I am. That guy thinks he needs Jesus worse than me. Because that's exactly what I think. I think I need Jesus more than anybody in this room. That ought to be all of our attitudes. That you need Jesus worse than anybody you know. That's the process of allowing this wisdom that is first pure. It's really pure. It's, God, I'm allowing you to change me. It's not, it is not being completely free from sin. Because if you go through 1 John, what you see is John goes, if you say you have no sin, you're a, you're a liar. And I think in the original Greek it does stinking liar. You're a big fat liar. It's an issue. But I can be allowing God to come in and empower me and change me. And I can have victory in, a, in the moment and in the day. Jesus said, listen, my deal is I get to run your life. No one's more important than me. That's the deal of salvation. No one's more important. Not man's wisdom, my wisdom. And that's why we're supposed to know this. Wisdom is peaceable. I really like that. Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Okay, Christians, let's be mature, and we're going to have this wisdom, this discernment, this spiritual discernment where we're, we've grown and we really get that it's all about Jesus. In 1 John, he, as um, John goes through and talks about maturity, he goes, Fathers, this is what fathers know. They know the one who runs their life. There's just this simplicity of, it's all about Jesus. It, it goes beyond the simplicity of getting saved. It's all about my salvation too. It's all about Jesus. Not about my salvation. It's about the guy that gave me that salvation. That brings me to that place when I deal with people. Listen, as we get to share with people, what's supposed to happen is there's supposed to be some peace that comes with that. Titus 3, 1 says this, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, and speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. There is nothing worse than Christians that aren't able to show people that, that um, God will meet them right where they're at. Christians that give off a flavor of, my life is better and you need to come and be like me. What should, they should be saying is, God can come in and meet you right where you're at. Right where you're at. You don't have to clean up. You know, we want sinners here. Well, because they fit right well with all of us. But people that don't have a relationship with Jesus, they're in the midst of just some messes. That's exactly who I want here. You know, there's been a number of occasions, you know, we have a thousand plus people coming on a Sunday morning and yeah, I don't know them all and then I get to know some stuff and I meet this couple that, you know, and this has happened a number of times. I meet this couple and I find out they're not married. And so I say, oh, you're not married. You need to leave the church. Is that what I do? Absolutely not. What I say is, hey, I got some verses for you. A couple things to think about. You guys should go look at these, pray about it, come back and talk to me. Because I need to meet them where they're at. And almost in every occasion, almost, I think it's like 90%, absolutely. They come back and go, hey, uh, we should get married. Hey, that's a great idea. Well, how do we do that? Well, yeah, so, you know, what do you think God's telling you? Well, we're really not supposed to be doing certain things, and we are. I said, what do we do? I said, well, it's better to marry than burn. 
And they go, yeah, that's right. I go, you need some money to go up to Idaho. <laughs> that's what I say. Well, we, we, yeah, all right, we'll go do that. Because they're just wanting to do what Jesus says. Either stop doing the thing that God goes, that's not good for anyone. It's not a great example. But obedience, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice, right? And it wasn't, did they get any, were they more pure once they got married? No, just obedient. Oh, it was nice that someone would come alongside of them like they did with me. And just go, hey, you should think about this. Uh, I, I remember um, I was uh, a couple years old as a Christian, and I'm, I, I'm bent because of some of my past issues. And I thought anybody that was on TV, one of them TV preachers, this is back in the 80s, those guys are all wackadoodles as far as I was concerned because everything I'd ever experienced with those guys was in my thinking was just bad and so I'm in a meeting and I just start talking about some stuff and I go and that Billy Graham he's such a jerk <laughs> and this guy he looks over at me and goes hey hey Mitch I go yeah and I know oh oh and he just kindly goes you should go check out Billy Graham I know I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> okay, all right. So I go check out Billy Graham, and I come back, and everybody, I said, I went, I'm a jerk. Billy's not. Because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. But he just came along inside me and go, go check it out. See if you know. He knew my maturity level. He cared enough to just let God deal with me and, and didn't leave me there. But wasn't like, how dare you say that about my Billy Graham? And he loved Billy Graham by the way. But he wanted God to do a work in my life and he cared more about those things. Peaceable. That's something that should be known. We're supposed to bring peace in. Gentle, it says. 2 Timothy 2.24 says this, and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. So, was, you know, we have this idea about what gentle is, and it's not necessarily scriptural. Gentle is this, folks. What level do you need to rise to to help someone in the midst of a thing that's destroying their lives? So, Jesus comes into the temple, and there's some money changers, and he goes over to them and shakes their hand and says, hey, y'all, love you. You just need to stop. Or, that's one option, but if I read my Bible correctly, he comes in and he whips them and turns over their table and says, knock it off. And, and obviously he'd been through there before and he'd, he'd been talking and he'd been teaching the truth and these guys didn't care about it and they didn't care about the fact that they were stopping people from coming to the Lord. And the Lord's never happy with that and he's going to get their attention and there's some cost to it. So gentleness is just rise to the level you need to rise to. Um, there's been occasions where I, I, seriously, I've told people, listen, if you go any farther, I will break your leg because I love you that much. Yeah, me and Steve and another guy, we have an agreement. If we go certain places, I'm, I'm going to, if I go certain places, I expect Steve to come break my leg. Literally. He probably wouldn't, but he's going to make it really hard for me to run away from Jesus. That's the point. I need to care enough, and, and when people's hearts get hard enough, then there's different levels that you need to take it to. Um, 1 Thessalonians 3.16, it says this, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. So gentleness can be just going, if you want to go out there, go ahead, but we're not going there with you. And while I'm, you're saying that God says it's okay to go out and drink and party, and that's not what the Lord says. And so until you get that straight, I'm not even eating with you. I'm withdrawing from you. Now, not my choice, yours. If you get it straight, I'm all good. 
So in 1 Corinthians, there's a guy that's sleeping with his dad's wife in the church that is um, definitely having milk and no meat. There's a lack of maturity. It says, oh, we are so loving and kind and gentle. We even allow that. And Paul says, kick him out. Otherwise, me and you are going to go. <laughs> that's I just love Paul. And when I come, it's not going to be good for you. So they kick him out. And then in the next letter, Paul writes to that church at Corinth. Paul says, hey, put him back, knuckleheads. He repented. That's the heart that Jesus would have. That's what we're talking about when we talk about gentleness. Peaceable. And then willing to yield. You know, you need to be able to listen. That's just such a clear picture. 1 Corinthians 6, 7 says this. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? Our picture that we give to the world needs to be the one that, uh, that literally says, I'm willing to be taken advantage of. I, don't, I shouldn't be out there um, suing other Christians because they didn't treat me perfectly. Again, how do I deserve to be treated? I deserve to, how I deserve to be treated is I deserve to fry in hell for eternity. What does God want to do? Well, he wants to love me. But my attitude is, I have eternity. I can't wait to get there. This life is not what it's all about. I'm not consumed with, hey, how dare you treat me like that? Now, the test of this, willing to yield, is driving. <laughs> right? When someone cuts you off, how, what's your response? How dare you cut me off? But one of the, you know, I, I have a number of these stories. The first one was someone was cutting line, cutting in the line in a, a supermarket. I hate to stand in lines. It's like my worst thing. And so this person comes and stand in the line, and I literally, I'm ready to go just throw down. I'm going to, I, and there, and I have justification because there's someone that else in front of me, so I can say I'm protecting others. <laughs> and, and God just talks to me and goes, I don't think you love them. <laughs> I don't think you're trying to do the best for them. And so I stop, and I get my heart right. And then a few years later, I'm driving up, um, not Clearwater, uh, Columbia Center, to a hockey game, and a guy stopped in the, in the middle of the road, and he won't get out of the way so I can get around and get through the light just because he wants to turn left and he, even though there's no room, he's just going to block the road. And I'm watching this and I'm watching it and all of a sudden I'm, I'm throwing my car in to park and I'm starting out the door and Marcy's grabbing me because I was literally going to go snatch him out of his car. You, and it wasn't cuss words. It was certainly things that the Bible says, don't call someone a fool or say rock. <laughs> there were issues in my heart for sure. But I, it was, um, Mark's like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, maybe this isn't good. And, and God was showing me this attitude in my life of, how dare you get in my way? That's never something that has a wisdom or a discerning heart. It's not peaceable. It's not gentle. When I'm trying to protect myself, it's never good. So it is something that God wants to do in our lives. Guys, again, we live in dark times. When you handle those situations differently, God will open up doors for you to reach into lives like no other because you handle it differently. And they wonder, you know, I got saved because I watched my wife not handle those situations the way she always had. I, I, how does she do that? That is not her. It's, a, it's her, but it's a better her. It's a nicer her. 
It's someone that's other-centered and not self-centered. That's what God's doing when he allows us to have this pure wisdom. Willing to yield, full of mercy. If you're going to err, err on the side of grace. If you're going to err, don't err on the side of harshness, err on the side of grace. And after you've erred on the side of grace for a while, then you want to do a little truth, truth in love. But I'd much rather err on the side of grace. You know why? I need a bunch of that. <laughs> With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So I really do want to just show a little grace. and Because I'm going to be that guy, and I have been that guy that's cut you off. A few years ago, Nelson, my awesome brother that was trying to cause me to stumble, sees me on the road, and I don't recognize his car, I'm not paying attention, and he comes in and cuts me off. And I, and I and seriously, I didn't even know that it was him, it never occurred to me, I just know this guy cut me off. And he comes to church the next Sunday and goes, hey, sourpuss, what? I cut you off, you should have seen the look on your face. Oh, jerk, you, are, you hate me, you caused me to stumble. Uh, and maybe I need to watch my attitude, right? That's the deal. Without partiality and without hypocrisy, there should be a truth that I'm, again, the guy that is needing forgiveness, and that's why I forgive it. I'm the guy that needs love and understanding, and that's why I give it. I'm not the high and mighty Christian that has it all together. I'm the guy that is loved by the Lord, even though I absolutely will, will do just incredibly self-centered things and have to repent on a daily basis. I was sharing with the guys on um, Tuesday morning, just there's some things that I do with the Lord, man. There's some things you need to be doing with the Lord. And one of them is every single day, get right with him. Every single day, you make sure that you've bowed your knee. And I, that's not a literal thing, and it can be if you want. But you go, you're the Lord, and I'm sorry, and you better do something with me, or I'm always going to be like that. Sometimes at the end of my day, that's exactly what I say to him. God, I'm sorry. You need to do something with me. If you don't change me, I'm always going to be like that. And then the other thing I do is I, I start with victory. You know, right after that, I've got victory. I can go to sleep. Stuff, I, seriously, the weight of the world comes off of me. Oh, all right, I can go to sleep. I don't have to sit there and go, oh, I wait, uh, why did I, oh. I, I'm, I, Lord, I'm forgiven. And in the morning, I get up and I go, hey, I get to go serve you today. I don't know how it's going to go, but that's my intention. And those two things happen on, in my life. And I try and make sure both of those things are happening. Because it's wisdom. It's discernment. I'm looking past this moment. Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Interesting. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The fruit of righteousness really is peace. So I go and I give Jesus my sin, and he gives me his righteousness. And what do I get? Peace. It's so awesome. When you do that, you know what the fruit of that is? Sown in peace by those who make peace. I go out and I make peace. I point people to Jesus. When you're helping people, you have to point them to Jesus. There's issues that go on. You know, here's an example. When someone has an addiction problem, whether it's alcohol or drugs or, or whatever it is, we have all kinds of things that we have addictions for and we have programs for them. AANA, all kinds of different programs. 
when someone's drinking, let's just take alcohol, and they have a real issue with alcohol. I can send them to AA, and lots of times they'll get sobered up. And if they don't meet Jesus, they're going to fry in hell for an eternity. So what does it matter? You get what I mean? Now, it's a good thing that they got sobered up. That's a great thing. But if they don't meet Jesus, then I've done nothing for them. If I send them someplace what focuses them more inwards and puts less Jesus in there, then I have been a fool. I've had no discernment. I've had no wisdom. I, I tell this to um, my guys on Tuesday morning. We're just talking. And, you know, in our world, we have an educational system that tries to get rid of Jesus. It is actively seeking to get rid of Jesus. And so if you're in that, you need to be a light. If you're thinking about sending your kids to college, you better do your homework. Because if you send your kids to, the, to college and get them a degree as an engineer or a doctor or whatever it is, as an IT guy, I, I don't care what it is, it, medical degree, in all the different um, areas you can get a degree, if they walk away from Jesus, that's the worst thing you've ever done. Because they have to spend eternity going, I wasted my life. They need to know Jesus, and that's the most important thing any of us will ever do. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Make sure you're sending people to Jesus, because when people meet him, when people meet Jesus, there's peace. There's joy. There's hope. There's a depth that goes on at that point. That's the kind of wisdom and discernment that Christians should have. Think about eternity. Is this going to help people have an intimate relationship with Jesus? Am I pointing to them to what Jesus says or what the world says or what I say? I want to point them to Jesus every single time. If I don't do that, then as a Christian, the best that happens then is I look over and, and God goes, hey, I'm going to judge your works. Oh, that's all burning. That's hay, wood, and stubble. And you wasted all that time. When I point them to Jesus, there's some, a whole other work, things that last for eternity, and I might even get a crown for it. And not that I want a crown because the Bible says that when we get to heaven, God gives us crowns and then this is what we do. Dad, you did the work. We throw them at his feet and going, you're the best and that's all I know. I want one thing and that's what, I, seriously, I want one thing, Jesus. He is everything that's good, everything that's true. He's the depth of wisdom and we don't settle for less. We go to his word and allow it to speak to us. It it never changes. It's not any different than it was 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. It's the same truth. We have just enough time to do communion, which is uh, an awesome place to end up. And so if um, the worship team will come up here, we're going to head for communion. When we take communion, what goes on, and you can come up and take it yourself as we start this, but it, it's just a picture of getting your relationship with Jesus right. The Bible says don't take the cup. Don't take the bread in an unworthy manner. Don't sit there and go, I'm holding something back from you, Jesus. Sometimes I understand. Listen, I do. I understand. Sometimes the best you can say is, God, forgive me. You need to do something with me. Otherwise, I'm always going to be like this. God's absolutely good with that the Bible says, because your understanding is it's him doing the work of taking away your sin and giving you his righteousness. And it's when you take this, uh, you know, you stop and you just go, Lord, what do you want? And you say yes to him. And that's what you're saying yes to. The, the bread is his body broken for you, him willing to pay the ultimate cost to suffer for you because you're, listen, you're that valuable. So when you take it, it represents how much value he placed on you. There was no depth that he wouldn't go to. And, and obviously, 
The cup represents his blood spilt for you, paid for and cleansed. When you take that cup, it represents an absolute true thing. When you've done business with him, you're clean. And we do it in remembrance of what he's done for us. You make him Lord, and that's the awesome place that it's supposed to be. So I'm going to pray, and then these guys will start singing. And then as um, you feel God's led you, you come up and get it, and you can take it on your own. We'll finish up, and that'll be it for the service. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your son. Thank you for your love, and God, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you've said that anyone that comes to you and calls on your name, you'll answer. Lord, we're desperate and needy for you. And as we just take communion, God, we ask that you would um, just come in. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Fill us um, with your righteousness and make us uh, vessels fit for use. God, that you would fill us to overflowing with your love and your mercy. And Lord, we're, we just want to do this communion and um, the one thing we want us to do is say yes to you. You, Lord, are our one hope. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.